oh, it, was, it was fascinating to see all the different injuries. Um, and I've learned over the years, you say, say you got, I don't know, eight guys in the back of a truck that runs over an IED, all eight of them can be injured in eight completely different ways. Yep. And so I've learned that in each one of them, that even if they two people had the same type of injury, it affects them differently. It's so it's it's an infinite number of ways that people get injured visually or non-visually, as we like to talk about. And I'm not even talking about just your brain injuries and your PTSDs. I'm talking about the in interior injuries that we can't see that are still going on that affect how you compete. You know, you have to, you have to ask these guys sometimes. So what's your story? I love to ask, what's your story? Usually they'll tell me what happened, what's going on. I'm like, okay, so in the water, tell me what you can do. All right. We're back with my coach ish. Um, (laughs) Actually my friend Tracy, she is the Swim coach for the SOCOM team for the Warrior Games. We met in 2018, and she was helping out for the Team Navy trials. Hi, Tracy. Hi, how are you? Good, good. So it's been a while since we've actually seen each other face-to-face. Actually, you know what? No, you were out there with us in January of 2020. Yes. Yep, I sure was. So I talked to Jules about this on the podcast. We were out in LA during, what was it? The end of January, 2020? I believe so. And um, long story short, we were probably patient zeros, all of us, for COVID, considering we were traveling through LAX um, (laughs) right as the pandemic was starting. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. And that was the last time I saw you in person. I know we follow each other on Facebook and see that you're doing a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. But before we get too far into this, I got to ask you, how did you get into coaching and swimming? Was that something you did as a kid? Were you passionate about it from early on? Yeah, I always loved the water. I was a water baby growing up. Um, One of my first memories, we used to have those little round blow up floaty rings. Oh, yeah. I remember being in the pool my mom and dad were sitting on lounge chairs and I just put my hands up and went underwater. And I remember looking up, my mom pulled me back up and put me back on the float and I kept doing it. And I just was never scared of the water, even though I couldn't swim. I just kept doing it. And she finally had to get in and play with me and, and whatnot. But I just always loved the water. And then in fifth grade, I think it was fourth or fifth grade, I was spending the night with a little girlfriend and um, she had swim team practice. So I had to wait and sit in the bleachers for her hour practice. And I was like, well, that looks like fun. I want to do swim team. And so that's how I kind of got into it. Not realizing it is fun, but it's a lot of hard work. (laughs) So that's how I got into swimming. Yeah. So what part of the country was that? Atlanta down here. Okay. Okay. So you've, um, have you been in Georgia your whole life for the most part? Whole life. Yep. Entire life. So growing up, I mean, how important was swimming to you from a like academics, athletic standpoint? Um, well, at first, like I said, it was just fun because I was nine years old, almost 10 at my first swim meet, which it, funny enough, when I was took lessons, um, I think I was at the Y, maybe mom put me in lessons and I never actually completed my beginner course correctly. I always stopped in the middle and put my foot down and kept going. So I actually never passed my beginner swim lesson test. (laughs) Um, And then my first swim meet, I was almost 10 years old and fault started both, both events. So I wasn't very good at it to be quite honest. Um, So it was just when I joined swim team, it was just to be with my best friend and have fun and play around in the water. And that was all dandy. And uh, my dad just thought I was going to be a wreck swimmer for my entire life. I literally just had no natural swimming talent. I was, I was athletically okay for a kid running and jumping and coordination wise, but swimming wise, zero talent with that. And then my, I want to say 
seventh grade or eighth grade, we got a new coach at the around team who was fresh out of college. He's an all American swimmer in Alabama um, would have been on the 80 Olympic team had it not boycotted. So he was at that higher level. Oh, of wow. swimming. And he brought that into our little kids program. And I wanted to quit after yeah, the first three days. No, it, was, it was a very drastic change from we're playing games and sharks and minnows half the time to we're doing sets and you will get better. And I remember going home crying. It's like, I want to quit swimming. And mom said, well, I paid for the month. So you're going to finish the month out and then we'll talk about it. Well, by the end of the month, he had calmed down. We had acclimated enough. I mean, the parents probably had to go to him and be like, dude, you're going to lose your whole team if you're, if you don't calm down. Mm-hmm. So, uh, I ended up staying and he got me to nationals and he's, he was one of my best friends. It's almost like a second dad growing up. You know how coaches and swimmers have that tight bond. So, um, still talk to him this day. And, and he actually became a warrior coach for the army at one point. Oh, nice. So, yeah. Yeah. So now, um, you said you went to national. So I take it that was in high school or was that in college? I, that was in high school. Uh, you have different levels, state region, Nash, junior nationals, national. So I was a junior national level swimmer, which still put me in the elite category, but at the very bottom of it. So at that point in time, I, when I was 16, my junior in high school, I might have been like, I'm thinking maybe top 200 females in the country for my, oh, wow. you know, so senior nationals is like top 50 and the Olympics is top two, just top, to give you some top two mm-hmm. Olympic States, two swimmers per event. Unless oh, it's three. Really? Mm-hmm. I didn't know that. Damn. Yeah. Yeah. It's the elite period. Yeah. So did you, continue, did you uh, get a scholarship and go on to compete collegiately? I walked on at Georgia, actually, because they were starting to come up. They were t- top 20 at the time, top 15. I want to say my sophomore or junior year was the first time Georgia broke top 10. So I actually walked on, but I had partial academic scholarships to help. And then um, I just worked my tail off, to be quite honest. And you can ask any of my coaches from when I was a child, to collegiate to master swimming, I, I'll work hard. And that's the only reason I got any kind of uh, anything done, any kind of records or, or what I'm trying to say is any, that's the only reason I was any good, basically. Um, so then my coach at college, if he had, a, he had a book scholarship left over and he'd throw it my way and that kind of thing. So I kind of just meandered through college. And like we say, my very first year, I played wall tag, meaning I didn't make any of the intervals. I literally would touch and go. I couldn't make any of the intervals because I was the slowest one on the team. But I stuck with it all four years. Oh, nice. Nice. So yeah. after, after you got out, did you stay with swimming or did you move on into like the business world and go get a real job? No, I've been doing this forever. So way back in the day, at 15 years old in the summer, I started teaching swim lessons with my then coach, my little, my little kids coach. I started teaching swim lessons and then I would do that every summer in lifeguard, including when I was in college, I'd go home and lifeguard and, and teach. And then after my fourth year of college swimming, I did a fifth year to be a regular student and just to finish up and uh, started coaching the little kids team there. So that's how I got into coaching there. And when I finished my fifth year, I'd been accepted to grad school for um, sports medicine and got offered a coaching job in Gainesville, Georgia by the coach up there. He knew me, knew of me. And so I was like more school, which I didn't really enjoy. I was good at it, studying and going to class and don't really enjoy it. And then, or, you know, making a paycheck, right. doing something I like. So I started coaching right out of college. So you've been doing this for your entire life then. I mean, yeah. swimming and Tracy are synonymous. Pretty much. Yeah. So as, what year roughly was it that you got out of college? Uh, I graduated in 93. Okay. So over the next eight years, um, probably for you, did you know much about uh, veterans and the military service? No, nope, knew nothing. Hadn't even thought of it. I know some people that went into the military from school. Some of them went to the academies and whatnot. Some of my swimmer friends. It, it, for some reason, I'm not really sure why. 
it just was never in my head that, that was an option. And I don't know why. Uh, my dad was a veteran. It, he did his two years when he got drafted in Korea. Um, and we were definitely pro uh, military, that kind of thing. But it just wasn't a huge part of our household. So I didn't know anything about any of this, especially wounded warriors and adaptive sports. I, I knew nothing. So then um, that day happened, uh, September 11th. Do you remember it? Vividly. Yeah. What, what were you doing when September 11th happened? So at the time I was actually bartending and I had gotten home and fell asleep on the couch at three o'clock, four o'clock in the morning and woke up and the TV was on. I just had a TV on. I woke up to the first plane hitting the building. And I was like, wow, what a crazy story. How did the plane just get that far off course? We all were like, oh, what a tragic accident. That's so bizarre. And then while I was watching the second plane hit, and I immediately was like, that's a terrorist attack. It was an immediate thought. And um, it just changed everybody's life. I remember watch, just standing in front of that TV all day, watching what was going on. Yeah. So did that bring, um, in the months following, did that bring attention to you about um, the service more, like more forefront watching the stuff that probably at that point in time was going on in Afghanistan that was being broadcast on the news, um, seeing people, did you ever see anyone come back into your neighborhood or people that you had um, maybe not direct relationships to, but secondary and ter tertiary? No. No, you know, I just, I didn't, I just knew, I mean, we were going to, a, in college, we were going to a swim meet on the bus and that's when they, our coach put the radio on because they were sending people over there starting Desert Storm. I okay. remember that, um, obviously the attack and then saying, we're going to go over there and, and, and do not, that. But, you know, start our, start our stuff over there. And I, I knew of it. I just had zero direct contact with anybody. Um, I, I, you know, some of my dad's friends are veterans and that, but it was, that scene was such a, oh, you guys served way back then. Yeah. Kind of not even, not current people. No, I, I still have no contact with any of them. So did, would you have ever imagined prior to September 11th that you'd have so much interaction with uh, veterans, let alone wounded warriors? No, not a clue. And so, it's a great surprise. <laughs> <laughs> surprise. Yeah. So when when did um just veteran issues and and not necessarily coaching or becoming part of the adaptive sports programs, but when did you first take an interest in seeing what was happening out there and how people were uh, coming back wounded or just veterans in general? Well. I mean, I was always curious as to why our Vietnam vets got treated so badly. You hear about that. And um, I had actually dated a guy whose uncle was a Vietnam vet. And we went to his house and was, and was visiting. And just some of his memorabilia was sparked an interest. And the fact that he would not tell any stories about anything, that kind of sparked an interest. Like, what is actually going on over there? I started realizing that civilians don't know anything about what's going on in there. You think you might from movies and that kind of stuff. You know, that's fantasy, that's fiction for the most part. And I started realizing, so this was back in, that had to be, that was around 2000, 2001, when I started realizing that we have no clue what's going on, what they're going through, you know, what's going on with the guys when they come back and the girls when they come back with their issues. Um, it was, and that was just a small little inkling you know, just a little spark. It sparked my curiosity, but then you live everyday life. You just keep doing what you're doing. And we're kind of shielded from that. We were shielded from that. Now it's definitely more prevalent and uh, with social media and um, a lot of the veteran organizations are trying to do stuff about it. The warrior games and Victus games, trying to put it out there in public where it's like, this is what's going on. You guys need to understand our boys and girls are going over there and coming back different. Definitely. Definitely. I 100% agree with you on that. Yeah. So as the, the stuff in Afghanistan is going on and um, President Bush says, you know, go continue to live your life. Nothing to see here. We're just going to go take care of this issue. What is a day in Tracy's life as a, as a swim coach post 9-11 like? 
Um, I was teaching. So I started teaching full time. And I was coaching a little bit on the side from the team that I grew up with. So that was a couple hours there. I was bartending. I was doing three jobs trying to get my business started up. So I was concentrating on that. So yeah, I was definitely still in my little bubble of working hard and trying to survive and trying to get my own business to thrive so I could work for myself and stop doing three jobs at a time. <laughs> you know, and I was coaching summer league with that. Um, so it was just, it was just busy. It was just a lot of trying to get things moving up and onward and growing and, and that kind of stuff. So then in 2003, the, uh, the big issue kicked off that probably up until that, up until probably 2010 created the most casualties, which was Iraq kicked off. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm assuming you kept an eye on that as that was happening had you seen or heard anything about wounded warrior programs at that point in time no nothing like very ignorant about all of this yeah as so, i assume most civilians are unfortunately yeah um i that's kind of one of the reasons why i'm doing this is hopefully to tell as many stories as possible and the reason why i'm having you on is because you support us so much and like you said you had no idea anything about us prior to no so um i guess we'll cut to the chase <laughs> um so at what point in time let me back up so between 2003 and 2000 roughly nine ish okay uh, on the navy side we really didn't have a solid program when i came to bamc going through my issues um in 2007 they just stood up navy safe harbor the Marines had um, the Wounded Warrior Battalion. The Army had A2, I think it is, in the Air Force. Uh, probably. AFW. Oh, that's right, AFW. I was thinking they, they bought them bagels or something. Not quite sure what the Air Force does anymore. Um, <laughs> so all of that being said, around 2009, 10-ish, um, someone in DOD came up with a great idea of adaptive sports. Yes. She did. So she was a Marine too. Was she? Yeah. Do you even, know this? No, I have no idea. Okay. So here's the story as I know it. Um, I've told it several times and I believe it's pretty correct. And there might be some nuances that I'm, I'm missing, but major Susie Stark swam at the university of South Carolina. And when she finished swimming, joined the Marines, but she also started doing triathlons and was really good at it, like nationally ranked. So the Marines are like, this is your job. You're gonna do triathlons and be a Marine and compete in sports and this, and that, and the other. So she was at the Olympic Training Center training for um, triathlons to represent the Marines. Now, at Georgia, we had a, a girl, Sheila Taramina, who's my roommate and teammate, who swam in the 96 Olympics and won a gold medal on a relay on my birthday in my hometown. So that's kind of cool. Wow. And then she went back to the Olympics in, so that was 96. So 2000, 2004, she went back to the Olympics as a triathlete, um, got sixth place in 2000. I'm not sure what she did in 2004. And then 2008 went back as a pentathlete. So she's the only female to go to the Olympics in three different sports. Oh, wow. Yeah, she's Wait, a little fire. Which, which one's the pent? What's the pentathlon? It's the five. It is swimming. I know there's fencing, horseback riding. There's something in track, and cycling. Maybe I can't remember. There's five things they have to do. Okay, so it's not it's not like a triathlon where it's back to back to back to back. No. They could just compete in five different things and score points. And then the total balance points determines your, your place. Okay. 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 That so, was like, why have we not heard of this before? That makes more yeah, sense. Yeah. It's a, it's an interesting sport. Kind of like the decathlon um, yeah. for That's, men. I had no idea that even existed. Well, that was Bruce Jenner. That's why he was called the greatest athlete of all time. Well, because I knew about the decathlon. decathlon. Yeah. I yeah. knew about the decathlon. I didn't know that there was a pentathlon. For women, I believe it's the, the women have a pentathlon, the men have a decathlon. I believe I might and, be wrong on that. And like, if I remember right, the 
the decathlon is all um, is all track and field. Yeah, because I I, I believe yeah, so. The, yeah, the, hurdles, javelin, you know, long yeah, the, jump. Stuff, the, so. pentath- the pentathlon gets even more interesting because it's discredited sports. Like, you're talking about you, fencing and horseback riding. Yeah, how it's do you do? How are you Olympic level in fencing and in horseback riding and in swimming? Right, it's super difficult. Yeah. Yeah. You know, they should do that all on the same day, though. They have 12 hours to finish. Oh, I wouldn't <laughs> want to do that. I can tell you that. Yeah. <laughs> so did you help train her at all? No, no, no. She was way, she was like, again, top, top four for um, relays for the Olympics. But um, no, she, she swam with Olympic coaches and, and trained with Olympic coaches for sure. But while she was training for the triathlon at the Olympic Training Center, she met major Susie Stark. Oh, okay. So Susie Stark got out of the Marines and decided she had not done enough and went back in and started the wounded warrior program or the, so, the she's the one that helps help start the warrior games. She wanted so, Olympic style events for our wounded warriors. So now did she go, is she part of, um, or was she part of OSD? Which is the DOD, which is a DOD office that that runs the Warrior Games, or was this pre all of Warrior? Care no, she that? she was in charge of Wounded Warrior Battalion for the Marines. Oh, okay, okay. So did so she went back in as a Marine. Then. I think she went as reserves doing it. I believe. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I, I just wasn't sure whether you when you said she went back in whether it was, you meant a uh, civilian uh, job or. No, was, when I met her, I, I believe she was um, active duty. Okay. Yeah. So. To back up a little bit, these different programs, AW2, um, Wounded Warrior Battalion, Safe Harbor, which I guess is now Navy Wounded Warrior Safe Harbor, um, and the bagel delivery people. It was to ensure that there was, I don't want to say continuity of care, but that there were, that there was care that was being provided to the wounded, sick, injured, and ill sailor, soldier, airmen, and Marines. The reason being is a lot of people slip through the cracks um, yeah. in their in their care, and they kind of worked as non medical yes. uh, case managers. And trust me, through my recovery, they made that very clear that they were case managers, but not medical case managers. Right. That being said, then in two thousand nine ten, Major Stark created this program, which was like you said, an Olympic style um, adaptive sports program. And now, can you explain the difference between adaptive sports and regular sports? Like for people who don't know what adaptive sports are, I always say, I always use Paralympics and sometimes I get (laughs) a blank stare on my face, on their face, like, huh? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I hate to use the term regular sports, but in sports, your, any, any kind of sports, you have your managing body that creates the rules and everybody has to follow the same rules. It doesn't matter your age. It doesn't matter your gender. It doesn't matter any of that. Um, Just for instance, in USA swimming, nine-year-olds have to follow the exact same rules as 19-year-olds. All the rules for all the strokes are the same for everybody. That goes with basketball, you know, NBA, everybody has to do the exact same rules and same skill sets and, that kind of thing. Well, it's adaptive sports. We adapt to what you're capable of doing. So for instance, in breaststroke, if you're swimming breaststroke, the rules are touch the wall with both hands at the same time. If you don't, you get disqualified. Well, if you only have one arm, that's impossible. So the adaptive rule is you can touch with one hand and say you have half an arm. You have to reach that half an arm out as an attempt to touch with two hands. Ah, okay. So adaptive sports let you, according to what your classifications are, and that means people with um, an amputation or an arm that is above the elbow is in a classification versus a different classification, somebody that's a double amputee versus somebody that's broken their back and is paraplegic or quadriplegic. Every classification is for the different injuries or birth defects as you're talking about paralympics um there are a lot of people with birth defects that have a missing arm or a wonky leg or things like that so you have to take that into consideration 
as well. So that's what the adaptive is. How can we fix your stroke or, you know, if you're riding a bike, how can you ride a bike? Well, some people have to sit down and they, they actually pedal the bike with their hands instead of their feet if they don't have any or they don't work. So that's what adaptive sports are. So now prior to finding out about Major Stark and the Wounded Warrior um, battalions in Safe Harbor and all of that, did you know anything about adapt? Did you train any adaptive swimming prior to yeah. that? Uh, in my lessons in coaching, I've had, I've had deaf kids, blind kids, cerebral palsy, MS. Um, I had a kid one time that, was, that had, had had a trait. So if he got any water in, he'd throw up. So I, I literally had to change what I would normally do with a three-year-old to don't blow bubbles, keep your mouth shut, and we can go under and swim. When you come up, make sure you're not sucking in water. Um, autistic kids, um, and all of them, you have to figure out what works for that individual person, especially with adaptive. Now, normally teaching and coaching, you still have to figure out each person's buttons to push or what works for them visual or talking to them or actually moving their limbs to show them a stroke. But when it's adaptive, you really have to think outside the box a lot on how to help this person attain what they they're able to and not really focus on what they're not able to do. Okay. That, that makes a lot of sense. So you, you kind of had a little, a little bit of um, insight going into this. Mm -hmm. And honestly, it's what's interesting, teaching three, two, three and four year olds how to swim helped me tremendously in teaching uh, wounded warriors. You mean giant of, two, three and four year olds? Some of you, yes. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. trying to figure out like if I could tell one two year old to blow bubbles, the other two year old might kiss the water and the other two year old is like, just put your face under is it's trying to figure out what works for each person. That makes sense. That, that, that completely. And I, I do think that I love all of my coaches. I think you guys have the most patience <laughs> ish. Um, <laughs> so at some point before warrior games, cause I, if I remember right, you were, you've been around since the beginning, right? No, actually. So going back to our little Susie Stark, Sheila Taramina, I saw Sheila's pictures on Facebook helping the Warriors, and I immediately called her up, and I said, as soon as you need help, let me know, and I'm in. And Christmas Day of 2011, she called me and said, hey, we have a Marine camp, Marine Corps trials, and I think it was March of 2012. You interested? I'm like, yep. Didn't know the dates. Volunteered, you know, this, that, and the other. Didn't know anything about it. It was like, I'm, I'm in. So I've been in since then. Okay. So, so yeah. almost what we in the Navy would call a plank holder. They're <laughs> there for the very first day the ship's out at sea. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so, or the, the initial crew is a better way of putting it. So you go to North Carolina to do this camp. What was that first day like for you, seeing all these wounded warriors? Oh, so, so we actually were in Pendleton. Okay, we Pendleton. Did that year. And I first off got got off the flight and went to the USO to wait transport. But they, since I wasn't actually one of the athletes, they forgot about me. I sat there for like three hours. And I finally was like, is there a bus that I'm supposed to get on? I mean, I had no clue what was going on. So I get on the bus and we get to, to there. We're in the barracks at that point. Um, I'm seeing all these people and their different colored shirts because that's when we had you know east and west and veterans and international so we had four different colored shirts for the athletes i think 300 athletes it was a huge huge so thing almost as big games. yeah it was it was almost as big as warrior games it was huge so uh, i'm just trying to adapt to almost military like we literally were in the barracks with you know the plastic mattresses that the sheets didn't stay on with no tv and no trash can we had to go we had to actually adapt the coaches actually had to adapt to a lot of stuff wait that. you, you well, don't have a plastic cover on your uh, on your bed at home no no sure don't <laughs> <laughs> uh, we ate in the chow hall with everybody um just 
being on base, you know, when they do taps at, uh, what is it, 8 a.m.? Uh, colors at eight and, ta and taps at, or, and, um, yeah, right. They lower the flag at sunset. Yeah. So, you know, getting used to that kind of stuff. And we were, we lived on base, which was interesting. Uh, I loved every minute of it. And then <laughs> our first meeting with everybody, you guys have so many acronyms for everything. I didn't understand half of what was being said on stage. So the other swim coach and I are looking at each other going, what does that mean? We're like, we don't know what this means. You know, fill out your AARs and do this and that and your MOSs. What is he talking about? Had no clue. None. Big learning curve. We, we speak a special language. Yes. Big learning curve. I'm still trying to figure it out. I mean, it, now, even still, oh, we need your metrics. I'm like, you need a what? We need your times, Tracy. We need your times. I'm like, oh, okay. Got that. Results, times. We need your metrics. <laughs> Well, we, you know, we're the military is kind of like the medical profession. We could probably just use English, but yeah. we have to feel special and use special words. Yeah, I'm always, I'm still learning. I'm, you know, I'll never learn all of it. It's not as important as making sure you guys are getting what you need, but it's, it's interesting for sure. Yeah. So, um, with all of that and the language barrier, um, <laughs> Were these guys assigned to different sports or did you, so like in 2018, when you guys met with us for that first coaches, I'll call it a pitch. Hey, mm -hmm. come check out this, come check out that. Um, did you guys have to go pitch them or were, did they already know what they were going to try out for? If I remember correctly, they had to pick the sports they wanted to do. So, um, SOCOM still like that. You, you tell us what you want to compete in. And then I have to go recruit sometimes. I'm like, wait, 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 you're only in two things. We need you over here at the pool. Mm -hmm. You know, come swim with, come swim for me, you know, constantly recruiting. And uh, yeah, so they would pick their sports and we would see whoever showed up at the pool. So we would have three, two hour sessions a day um, to rotate the athletes through. And for, they did, Trials was two weeks. They did like 10 days, eight, nine days, something like that of training. And then we went into com competition and they ran it like games. I mean, the full timing pads, the announcers, the starters, all referees, everything. Wow. So it was a fun swim meet. So what was your interaction? What was it like day one on the pool deck? Seeing some of these wounded guys come in for you. Oh, it, was, it was fascinating to see all the different injuries. Um, and I've learned over the years, you say, say you got, I don't know, eight guys in the back of a truck that runs over an IED, all eight of them can be injured in eight completely different ways. Yep. And so I've learned that in each one of them, that even if they, two people had the same type of injury, it affects them differently. It's so it's, it's an infinite number of ways that people get injured visually or non-visually as we like to talk about. And I'm not even talking about just your brain injuries and your PTSDs. I'm talking about the in, interior injuries that we can't see that are still going on that affects how you compete. You know, you have to, you have to ask these guys sometimes, so what's your story? I love to ask, what's your story? Usually they'll tell me what happened, what's going on. I'm like, okay, so in the water, Tell me what you can do. Um, if you can't rotate your shoulder the whole way, let's figure out how you rotate it halfway. And but yeah, there's it's just been interesting with all the different injuries and how people deal with it. Um, so one of the you know British humor, one of the guys, there was a triple amputee and a double amputee sitting there. Um, and I'll say that the triple amputee was amazing because his first year it was that that my first year. He was pissed. I mean, righteously pissed that he could not get out of the pool by himself with his one arm. And he was a big dude. He was a six foot four kind of guy. He could not pull himself out of the pool. And he was pissed. I was like, he was, he had been blown up six months. He was six months out of energy and couldn't pull himself out. And pissed. I'm like, you give yourself some time, you know, it's not going to be immediate recovery. We're working on it. And then he came the next summer. Sure enough, he was pulling himself out every single time. Oh, wow. Yeah. 
I've seen some amazing feats. It's, it's crazy. But anyway, the two Brits were sitting there and one of them, they're, you know, they're joking around with their humor. And one of them said, yeah, I left my leg over there. And the other one goes, I left two legs and an arm over there. He goes, I'm more, more pissed about my watch. I was like, wait, you lost three limbs and you're really pissed about your watch. He goes, it was a good watch. <laughs> Oh, so yes. that was my introduction to military humor. <laughs> our, our gallows humor is amazing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so as you're going through this, what's going through your mind as you're watching all these guys get in the pool and, and is, is it affecting you? Oh, God, yes. Oh, yeah. I mean, I don't think I've made it through a Warrior Games yet without crying. Just what they've accomplished. Because I'll see them when they first start. And maybe two years later, they win a medal or do something fantastic. And it's just like the transformation of the guys and girls, too. It's. See, I'm going to start crying with this one. I mean, I, I know this program has saved lives. I know it has because they told us. I mean, we've had guys email us back and says, I came here because I was voluntold to do this. I didn't want to be here. I was going to go home and shoot myself. And then I fell in love with it. And I'm OK. You know, I'm doing well, doing better now. I know it saved lives. I, I've seen it transform lives. I'm talking about guys that were, you know, at the top of their game, fit, physical fitness, the peak of it. And, and you know, they're out getting the bad guys and, and leading teams or whatever they're doing. And then all of a sudden it, it comes to a halt and they're angry and they're upset and they're depressed and they don't want to talk to people and they don't want to, I mean, I've seen girls do it because they've been injured and gained a lot of weight and their self-confidence just shot down to the bottom. And you see them walk around like this and they might say, Hey, if you say, Hey, and you could see their shoulders droop and just their body um, stature, you know, and over the course of a year or so, all of a sudden they start standing up a little bit straighter and they'll look you in the eye and they'll say, oh, hey, coach, how are you doing? I've seen it. It's amazing what this does. It really is. So after your first day, um, I know the coaches have a little bit more, let's say, ability to decompress than some of the athletes do. Um, you and your friend that you went down there with, the other coach, uh, mm -hmm. how did what was the conversations like for you? We, we would sit there and discuss like, wow, did you see what so-and-so did? Um, we really had to think about how to make this person start off the blocks versus in the water. He's, you know, he's got one leg. How do we, how do we work around this? How do we help him figure it out? And then, Oh, did you see the double amputee that started off the blocks because he rocked himself forward and throw himself off off of it? Or um, like, hey, this guy, this guy really didn't want to be here. And he doesn't want to do it. What can we do about it? You know, who do we talk to? Do should we talk to somebody? Or, hey, did you realize this person has this going on? Say, I had actually asked one one of the guys what was he, he was grimacing and I didn't see what was wrong um he had his limbs and was doing the strokes properly and he goes well you know I got shot through the stomach and it kind of hurts sometimes when I rotate like, oh hey okay. <laughs> thanks for the heads up need to know this you know so trying to tell the other coaches things we learned about each of the individuals as much as we can and we're trying to learn names trying to learn what the injuries are trying to figure out what they can do um and keeping it all straight for two weeks or so and then going back the next day and trying to, you know, progress with that, improve upon that a little bit as much as we can. So, yeah, it was just also a lot of, I'm exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> so did you guys get a lot of time with the athletes after training? That first, yeah, the first few years I did this, we literally lived with the athletes in the same barracks. We ate with them in the chow hall. We practiced them. So we actually didn't get away from them which took a toll, to be honest. We actually couldn't decompress at some points because we had to be on. You know, even the dining room, you go sit with some of them and talk to them, you're still on. Like, hey, I'm here to help, I'm, I'm coaching. So it was just until we went to bed, it was still, you were just on all day from like 6 a.m. to 8 p.m. And, um, and that was part of the exhaustion with the heat and being, you know, 
coaching that much. And, um, yeah, it was, I just remember the first couple of years, it was super tiring and I loved it. I actually loved it, but I realized we do need to get away sometimes and just be with the coaches kind of thing or by ourselves. So speaking of uh, getting away at the end of this, um, you did your two weeks in Pendleton, you helped select the team, I'm assuming, Mm -hmm. and you went home. Mm -hmm. How was it when you got home? Horrible. (laughs) (laughs) You can ask any of the coaches. We discussed this, like in my little, we have little groups of coaches that talk. We hate leaving. We hate going home. It just feels so weird to go back to quote unquote normal. Um, because you guys are so much fun. It's so much fun to, to be around you and see how you're thriving with this and seeing and seeing your transformations and seeing these amazing feats of, I cannot believe I had a quadriplegic do a flip turn. How, how is that even possible? Um, and being just being a part of some of this and then watching some of some of them go to the Paralympics. I mean, in, in Rio, I knew 10 people at the Paralympics that were competing in all kinds of sports. That's kind of fun. That's interesting. Really? Yeah. 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 So um, Ellie Marks, for instance, I was at her first army camp and she had injured her leg and had never swum before, but just took to it. She's a natural gifted athlete. And went to the Paralympics in Rio, won gold after winning at games and winning at Invictus. She went to the Paralympics in Rio, won gold, set world records in breaststroke. And now she's going back. Um, she finally got an amputation. So she actually should, I think she should be classified in a different classification because of the amputation. So she's going to go back and compete again. And she's oh. still active duty. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. I should yep. look her up once she retires. Mm-hmm. So, um, in terms of getting back into your routine with uh, the kids and the like, after dealing with the uh, wounded warriors, I'm trying to phrase this right, parents can be dicks. Sometimes. Um, did some of the pettiness that may or may not have come up get on your nerves at all? After the war games? after you dealt with all these wounded warriors and. Oh, I see what you're saying. Um, yeah, it definitely puts things into perspective for you. My parents, uh, I don't have too many issues with parents. I had one mom that she was a pain in the ass from the get go. And then I had, I think I had Marines and SOCOM back to back. I was going to be out of town for three weeks with you guys. And, um, she, I sent my email out to my clients. I said, I'm going to go work with the wounded warriors. I'll be back. And you know, whatever date I'll be back, we'll resume lessons. Then Well, she sent me a text. Like I'm a little upset. We've been coming twice a week for these three or four weeks to get ready for summer. And you're just going to, I didn't know about this hiatus. (laughs) <laughs> wow my blood pressure went up to here and she said something like is there another coach we can work with you know while you're gone and I just took 24 hours to calm down to respond and I said I'm sorry you feel that way please feel free to find another instructor and I left it at that I'm like I you just disrespected my guy my my swimmers you know and the military and what they've been through I, I don't even care if you ever come back. And she never did. She said, oh, no, no, we'll, we'll, we'll see you on the whatever the 28th was. She never showed up, did call. To, and actually, I sent an email out saying, I'm back. We can resume lessons. She never responded and just didn't show up, which I was fine with. But yeah, that was that was one. I literally had to calm down from that because of what I'd just been. I, well, I'd already done it. I knew I was going to go do and knew I was going to go see and who was going to go help. And she just called it a hiatus. And I just almost lost my shit on that one. Yeah, but, I don't blame you at all on that one. Yeah, yeah, but other than that, my parents are usually pretty good. They they love you guys. They they're always like, "Can you send us videos or tell us stories?" And my kids are very interested, and I try to do that and share what I can with them. And then um, that first time after the Marines, the first time I came home and got on our little transit bus, I was going, going taking Marta home, and these two little punk kids were up there like a real man has his homies back and a real man, you know, does this. And I just like, you guys have no idea what a real man is. None. 
I was just with 300 of them for two weeks and you have no clue. So I, I just think we remember that too. Yeah. Wow. Did you say that to them? No, I didn't want to get shot. Oh, you could have That's experienced something we true. did. <laughs> oh God, I need That's to true. remember I'm recording. No, anyways. So um, you were brought on kind of just to help out with mm-hmm. that first camp. Assistant coach. Yep. So did they bring you out to warrior games? No, they did not. No. So I, I didn't go to warrior games until 2014. So I, was, I helped the Marines with their trials and a couple of their camps and then Army needed some help, and I was up at, oh, I can't remember the name of it, a little above Virginia somewhere. I was up at, up there helping, and um, then Army had a, a combined camp with Air Force, and the Air Force brought me on as one of their three coaches. Oh, okay. So I was with Air Force for a couple of years because they had, you know, Air Force does everything bigger and better, and they had. Um, basically three coaches with three coaches and they had a group of competitive swimmers, a group of guys and girls that could swim down the pool. It might be ugly, but they could get back and forth. And so they had a coach for them. And then I was the coach for the ones that couldn't swim at all. And so I had people that were scared of the water. I had people that had had some drowning experience, almost near death experience in the water. Um, had one guy that had a really bad experience with his waterboarding training so that's the ones that I would work with. And I loved it. Absolutely loved it. Cause you're talking about from the zero, not even wanting to get in the water to trying to swim down the pool by themselves in a, a, you know, 10 days or whatever it was that we had with them. So, um, that was, that was some of my favorite things there too. So is that the first year you act? So that was the year you went to the warrior camps. I went, I didn't go with air force either in the interim. I'd been telling them I wanted to work with SOCOM. Um, I dated a guy that was part of SOCOM year, many, many moons ago. And I was like, well, the SOCOM is going to be your, I don't know, one percent, whatever they call them. I said, well, let me try that because maybe they're better athletes. Maybe, maybe not. Depends on what's going on. Um, swimming wise, no, just because they didn't like everybody else. They didn't swim in high school and college or, you know, maybe a Rex team or summer league here and there. For the most part, none of the Warriors really swam competitively growing up. And so SOCOM ended up needing a coach and I came aboard at Warrior Games. I met SOCOM for the first time. I was their coach, had not trained them, never met them, didn't know anything about them. And they brought me on at, at Warrior Games for some reason. And that was September 2014. That's when I started with them. So what was that experience like going to your first Warrior Games as a coach? Luckily, since I had been coaching the other teams, I kind of knew what to expect and what was going on. Um, war, I, and I'd been in enough national swim meets and stuff to understand how it's supposed to be run. Uh, it was interesting to see. I didn't realize that these guys and girls were doing multiple sports over a two week span and how, how hard it was on them. And so I was, I was getting a little upset. Some people were going in and coming out more injured than they went in because everything that goes on at games, it's insane. It's super hard. It's long days for 14 days and the swim meets at the end. So you got them all, they're broken down. Maybe they got in a bike crash. Um, could have broken their pinky playing volleyball thing, you know, all kinds of stuff happens at games. And so coming into it, I was like, Oh, this is a different experience. I'm used to coaching people that train swimming tapered and came in hot for a swim meet. Now we got guys that've never been at a swim meet before. Never even done a swim meet. They don't know what heats and lanes are. They don't know. Half of them didn't know the rules. So it was weird to coach the basics of a swim meet but then try to get them to to win medals you know so it was it was interesting yeah so what um where was that games that was out at the olympic training center colorado springs okay in 2014 yep so you do you do all of that in colorado springs how how did you feel about the reception they got out there as far as the whole 
did they do a big ceremony like they did uh, for us, or was it more subdued back then? Oh, God, I have to think about this. Because we've been out there twice. Let me, my first one. They, yeah, they did a, I'm pretty sure they did a welcoming parade and that kind of thing, you know, comments from higher ups and, and brass. Uh, yeah, they did opening ceremonies and stuff. And they didn't have the concerts back then. They were doing concerts in, in the past few years, but um, it was more of an opening ceremonies, opening remarks, light the torch, um, that kind of stuff, your basic stuff. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And if you're talking about like the community coming out. Yeah, or, that's what I meant more so. So it's interesting. We have been, we've tried to push this. People seem interested, but it's hard for them to come out on a Wednesday morning to watch track and field because they're working, you know, they, they have jobs and stuff too. Sometimes we get schools that would kind of do an outing with their classrooms. Um, churches would do that. But that that's kind of more with the, we would get with community. They would welcome us. You know, we would have restaurants give 10% off or things like that, but trying to come to watch events, we've never had a huge outpouring community love from that just because of schedules i would i would guess yeah um, we never i don't yeah so in chicago and i can't remember what year that was they did it in downtown chicago for that specific purpose to really get people to come and, and it's still you just you just don't get them to come watch really i, I kind of wish that more people would know about this and i, do, I absolutely do yeah even if you're not be able to get there in person, I mean, I stream every single uh, Invictus and um, Warrior games since I've been since I did the games. Okay. So I mean, I I watch it as much as I can, um, and I really hope that maybe more people will start to see it and understand it. But speaking of Invictus, um, I think at 2014 2015, uh, the UK Prince Harry decided to create his own version of the warrior games and include yeah. most of the coalition forces that were in Afghanistan and Iraq. Yes. Did you get involved with that at all? Uh, I, did. I was blessed to ask to be coach for 2016 and 2018 teams. So I was, I was able to be a swim coach for both of those, those Invictus games. Unfortunately, they were both in North America. I haven't been able to travel with that. <laughs> One was in Canada and one was at Orlando. <laughs> oh, okay. okay. I didn't get to do the big trip or anything, but you know, that was secondary anyway. Um, that was quite the experience. That's a lot of fun. So with Invictus, would you say that, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Was it, I, obviously it was more international. So was it more of an experience for you from the seeing all of the international wounded warriors or just such a big high profile event? Cause what I saw from, what was it, 2019, Sydney, it really did seem like they had a lot of people come out for that. Oh, yeah. So I, uh, in Orlando, it was held at the, what's it called, Wild World Sports down there? In Orlando, uh, we were actually having games this year, same okay. place. Yeah, the Disney thing, right? Yeah, yeah. So um, that's a neat little setup there. They don't have a swimming pool. So for Invictus, they actually brought a pool in and built one up, especially for us, which it was super nice. Um, that they're not for games this year. They're not doing that. We're we're renting out a, a pool somewhere. I'm not exactly sure where it is. They were still working on the details. And uh, so I, again, growing up competing, and my co-coach Bobby Brewer, who swam with me growing up, um, and he also swam at Georgia after me a little bit. Uh, so we have a UGA has a, a lot of people that have been involved with Warrior Games, interestingly enough. So Sheila got me. I got my girl, my coach from school, I mean high school, who swam in Alabama. He got Bobby because he coached Bobby. Bobby got Atiba, who went to Army. Atiba is still Army head coach. So there's one Alabama coach in the middle, but four of us, Georgia, and I had Beth come help Army one time. So you got five UGA swimmers. That have helped out because nice. it's all you know yes yeah, it's, it's kind of neat 
So just doing that, I'd been to big meets like that, that had been put on like that. So to me, that wasn't a big thing. Um, international. I knew half the international guys because they came to the Marine trials because the Marines would have a lot of international people at their trials. Oh, okay. So there are a lot of friendly, familiar faces there. Mm -hmm. So now during this time, were you doing, you were head coaching SOCOM? Mm Mm-hmm. And then I was still helping the Marines. I was still helping the Air Force. And finally, Navy wised up and finally got me a couple of years ago. Finally. <laughs> oh, the Navy. <laughs> <laughs> you so guys are great. You guys are the funniest team. I mean, just slap funny. Y'all are the funniest <laughs> people. Yeah. So, yeah. You um you gotta come down to Mayport, Florida. And I had already been pre-warned about you by what? Uh, a marine buddy that's a mutual friend of ours i know who you're talking about yeah adam's been on actually i was trying to get him on last week to catch up because he just started a nonprofit himself yeah yes 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 um he and i've been talking about certain things like that yeah oh good good so he um he told me oh you're gonna get this crazy coach uh tracy she's insane yeah what i think you tried to beat him or drown him or something like that i'm not 100 percent sure what you did to him they're Marines, little babies. They don't know what they're talking they eat about. Crayons, just leave it uh, at that. So, anyways, um, you guys come out to Mayport. You meet us. Uh, Jason's our head coach. Who I don't think he was out there for the first part of um. Yeah, because he coached the year-round team. I think they had a swim meet that weekend. I think we we arrived what on Saturday, Friday or Saturday. So uh, you probably yeah, had a I swim so. meet that whole weekend and flew in Monday morning. I think. Yeah, if I remember correctly. Yeah. So we had some people that uh, had experience in the Warrior Games themselves as competitors come out, mm-hmm. and then you had our new us new people. What's it like when you go to a new team and you're trying to help out, and it's not what you would typically think of a combat arms team like the Marines or the Army or SOCOM? Uh, that's irrelevant. Yeah, that's irrelevant to me because you're, you're swimmers. You're all swimmers to me. Oh, no, maybe I said that wrong. Uh, I should have I should have put the caveat that you didn't see a lot of traumatic wounds. Oh, versus, I see. Versus uh, uh, illnesses and, and more sure. like injuries. Sure. Uh, that's, again, you, you all, everybody there has something going on. Everybody. So, again, it doesn't matter if it's a missing limb versus your TBI. You know, it doesn't matter. You still have balance issues to deal with. You know, you have internal injuries to deal with. And um, who was it? Uh, what was Jules' injury? Was he the one that stepped on the stingray? Or the, uh, yeah, took a stingray the to the knee. Yeah. You know, yeah. you had a motorcycle accident. You had a lot, you know, cancer survivors or um, people dealing with cancer. So everybody has something. So even on the other teams in the Marines, you had a few amputations blown up shot whatever you want uh, but i wouldn't say it was a majority oh really okay you know so we've been dealing with um the other illness and injuries and stuff not necessarily combat related so I, i've been dealing with that tracy you dropped out hold on one second while well, zoom tries to reconnect are you there there you oh, go. there you are. You froze for a second. Yeah. You froze too. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So I just, I don't really, hell, I was talking to a guy one time and I gave him a set of flippers because you only need one. And I kind of looked over the pool side and was like, oh, yeah, I guess you do have a missing leg. I, <laughs> it just, I just see all of you guys as swimmers, honestly. It's kind of weird sometimes. Sometimes. <laughs> Y'all are weird all the time. Yes, we try our best. Um, yeah. So anyways, we met, we did the whole Mayport thing. Then yep. what was really cool about you specifically was you kind of bounced between all four teams at the uh, mm-hmm. Warrior Games, mm-hmm. um, which was really, really encouraging that you could really tell that you cared and that you were trying to, I, I noticed some coaches really played the team um the team spirit thing where it's like ignore those other teams 
but then mm -hmm. I think it was more so in swimming that it seemed like all the swim coaches kind of helped out as much as they could with all the teams. Absolutely. And, it, and we all know each other. All the swim coaches actually do know each other um, just from coaching together, but we all have the same ideas. If that makes sense, we yeah. have the same idea about what this is about. You know, this is not about building my resume. This is not about us. It's about helping you guys do your best. So the swim coaches, we all have, we all get it. I think in my opinion. Yeah. And it didn't seem like it was uh, really trying to like the athletes themselves were very competitive, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but the coaches didn't seem to try to throw shade or throw fire onto it. They didn't, they would meander through all the different uh, groups. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, helping people get in and out of the pool. If they need it. You know, cheering for the people that are dead last. Those are the people we're trying to coach basically, you know, um, the guys that win medals and stuff. Great. We love it. Let's go get the medals. Let's get on the podium, get your pictures, be proud of it. But then you got the guys that are just trying to survive literally in life and in the water. Um, that's who we're there for. That's what, that's who we're really trying to help is get them something that's physically active, which is healthy, something that's goal oriented, which is healthy, something that's got your team, which is healthy. So all of that, you know, this, we're just trying to improve your health mentally. Right. And, yeah. So at 2018 games, when we were doing the swim competition, uh, I was fortunate enough to be in the water with one of your athletes and I feel horrible because I cannot remember his name. Um, Captain. So calm guy. I think he was a quadriplegic. Oh, you talking about James? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. My quad. Um, and so, uh, he was a quad that was swimming laps. Um, I forgot what, ev what, what event it was. He did the um, he did the fifty free, the fifty back, and the hundred free, and the free relay. He did all of it. Okay. He couldn't do breaststroke because on his front he can't take a breath. But he did everything else on his back. So I think it was one of them. Um, there was probably fifteen or twenty of us in the water. It seemed like that were yeah. cheering him on to the yeah. end. That was their last relay. Yeah. Okay, that's what it was. Yeah, and it was incredible. And everyone, no one cared, team, country, whatever. What that's are moments like that for you? Like, that's the crying moments that I have at every games, you know, because that's what happened. It always happens. It's usually a relay because there's usually it's for those that don't know, there are different relays and they're they're based on the number of points. So classifications give you a, a number. 6.0 is going to be your TBIs. There are no physical limitations. Um not I'd say injuries because you can be injured, but not have any physical limitations that, that hinder you in your sport. Then it goes down from there. So say a 4.5 is a guy with a single leg, then it keeps going. So James was a 1.0, 1.5. I can't remember. I mean, he's quite, all he can do, his hands won't even open his limited range of motion with his arms. So he's doing like half strokes on his back. Can't kick, can't do anything else. Um, so he took, if I remember correctly, it took four minutes for him to swim down a 50 meter freestyle, 50 meter, four minutes. I want to say his hundred that he did was eight something minutes. Nope. Nope. His hundred was 12 minutes. It took him 12 minutes to go down and back. Um, and I know a few people, very few very few, but you're always going to have this. I have this with summer league and my little itty bitties that are slow kind of were like, he's taking too long. I'm like, don't ever say that again. That's you just missed the entire point of what's going on here. Um, so yeah, he did, he did three fifties and a hundred and never complained. Pro part of the problem was when he gets cold, his muscles will lock up. And so when you get in that water, it's chilly. So he, he has to kind of get going a little bit before he can warm up enough to actually do as much as he can do. And that's part of it. Trying to get him in and out of the water is part of it. And then you were there. It was just electric when all you guys were at the main line cheering for him. All the stands are standing up cheering. There's tears. There's, 
like unbelievable. And and yeah. by by some happenstance, uh, that night it made like number one or number two on. It was it was called. I still have the video because, yeah. So what happened? It I it was called. It's Sports Center must see. Right. So it's it's Sports Center, but it's must sc see you know, sports center SC. So they led off with this. It was a 30 minute little blip of him swimming and what he's doing and what Warrior Games is about. Interestingly enough, if I remember correctly, that same night, somebody had just won the NBA championships, but we led off with the Warrior Games in James, which is cool. Yeah. I mean, and I, I know a lot of people who saw that more like, yeah. wow. What, yeah. Do you remember what James did prior to his injuries? I don't know. Was, I don't, he, was he blown up or was that something else? Honest, honestly, I actually don't know. I, I was just being curious. I yeah, never, I, I never, yeah, I never followed actually, up. He actually never, I think he came to the pool once with me um, because he's working on some other stuff, but I never actually been able to sit down with him and get a story like I like to do. I just haven't had the opportunity to sit down and, and have enough time with him to do that. But, you know, now he does a lot. I don't know if you know, he um, has a nonprofit that gives and, and gets bikes ready for children that are um, adaptive, adaptive bikes for children. Oh, I had no idea. Huge. He does a lot of fundraising for that. He also helps with, there's a moving memorial flag that's made out of dog tags that they, they put up in different places. Yeah, he, he does a lot. He's pretty impressive. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I never had any contact with him other than that, that moment in the pool. Uh, I, I really wish I would have. Um, hopefully for the, for the people who had 2019 and this year, there'll be more um, inner athlete interactions. It was one of the only complaints I had about our, our warrior games was we were at hotel a army was at hotel B. Yeah. Everyone. Yeah. Was, I don't like that. I don't yeah. like that. Either. Not to say, not to say that I ever condone putting us in barracks. <laughs> <laughs> no, I do. Coaches agree. absolutely in the barracks. Sure. Uh, boy, uh, athletes somewhere else. Five star yeah. hotel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I have, I agree with the interaction. Absolutely. I mean, all you guys are brothers and sisters in arms over there. You know, what you should be the same here. You guys have similar stories. You know what's what you've been through. You guys can talk to each other. Like you can't talk to us regular people, civilians, boring, stay-at-home moms, you know, <laughs> kind of thing. So you guys get it. Even with your medications, I've seen it. Somebody takes their pills, like, oh, is that whatever medication? Yeah, I've been on it for a year. Well, what side effects do you have? Because it does this for me. Yeah. You know, how do you how do you help that? the conversations that I hear between, between you guys, um, is, is pretty interesting coming from the outside world, you know, that's kind of what we do. Um, that being mm -hmm. said, so you, like, like I also said, 2019, I sat out for a shoulder injury 2020. Yep. We uh, actually, I guess we did see each other in 2019 at the same camp, just, a year prior was that the bucket was that the bucket thing no the bucket thing was in mayport is that the first one yeah Mayport. yeah yeah so just so we all understand tracy is demonic as a coach <laughs> uh, but i i guess thinking about it now in retrospect and training for some track stuff and seeing some of the tools they use um, track athletes a lot of people who do plyometrics probably know about the parachute where mm -hmm. you strap a parachute around your waist and you run and it gives you resistance. Well, yep. Tracy and Jason like buckets. <laughs> They're big old five gallon Home Depot buckets. I mean, five or 10, whatever they are. Yeah. And, and these buckets are tied to you at the waist with what, like maybe 20 feet of rope. Yeah. <laughs> and you jump in the pool with your bucket and you start doing laps. So, yeah. Well, yeah. When we tried it, we had everybody go down the pool and back and just see how it was and say, this is something you could easily do at home because it's resistance training. So that way, if you're resistance training, 
the movement in the water, you actually have to push the water harder to move, but you use a specific swim muscles. Whereas in a weight room, you don't have weights that do breaststroke kick. You don't have weights that do backstroke pull. So you use a bucket and you're getting your resistance training other than the weight room. So we had everybody go down and back and then Tommy comes in and puts the bucket Late. on <laughs> and we're, he's just doing his bucket thing. And I'm coaching somebody else. I think we're working on flip turns or something, or I don't know what we're working on over there. Jason and I are coaching all of a sudden, like 10 minutes later, I look at you, are just still swimming with the bucket. I'm like, what are you doing? How many laps are you going to swim? And you just looked up and he goes, well, you didn't tell me to stop. <laughs> I, 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 you would have gone all damn day with that thing. Just to annoy the hell out of you. It did annoy me. I just felt, <laughs> I was like, you're an idiot for doing that many laps with the bucket. <laughs> Yeah. Don't, don't ask me what goes on in my brain when I do things like that. <laughs> but so um, the last time we saw each other in person was in 2020, right before, for lack of a better word, craziness broke out. Yeah. Um, how, as a swim coach who loves the pool, how has the last year been? Yeah. I mean, I was out of work for three months and then my facility finally opened up and luckily I was able to kind of go back into just doing what I did teaching wise. I didn't have to wear a shield. I didn't have to wear a mask, that kind of stuff. My parents knew this, everybody was okay with it. So I've been going kind of full, full steam ahead since last June for, for the last year. Um, I, have missed the warriors so much it's it's just not even funny like i just i just miss being with you guys i miss all that craziness i miss i always say i teach the little kids i go to warrior games and warrior camps and teach the big kids so i miss my big kids a lot and it's 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 been hard like that i can't imagine i really can't even imagine what it's been like for you guys not to be, go with your brothers and sisters and have that that group of like-minded people and people that have the same experiences because I know that's a huge part of it and if anybody's ever seen I it, when I train at camps and stuff we don't train we I teach technique do a couple laps and I'll sit there and let the guys and girls talk you know 15 minutes or so if they need to because that camaraderie that's when you start realizing your common your common points of interest or common points of illness even and how you get through it. And nowadays, especially, people are really starting to understand holistic health more so than popping 15 pills a day. Oh yeah. Now, really, yeah. I really, really like for you guys talking about that. Um, I went. I, that's a whole nother podcast. But uh, just even for me, sitting at home for three months, wake up, sit on the couch, eat, sit on the couch, eat, sit on the couch, go to sleep. It, it was just. It was awful. And I could literally feel it felt like that my ceiling was coming down on me and getting darker and just I could feel the depression coming on. So I'd, I'd hit the road and go to Florida a couple of times for fresh air, sunshine, that kind of thing. So I can't imagine people that were already having issues like that, being stuck away from everybody with nothing. You can't go anywhere. You can't do anything. I, I, I can't imagine how hard it's been. Well, it's a double-edged sword for people. Uh, I can talk from my own experience. Uh, it's one thing to be a hermit and have the choice not to be. Mm -hmm. It's another thing to be told, hermit, we are not going to force you to stay being a hermit. Yeah. And, and I think that the biggest thing for me was the lack of choice. Yeah. Not, not the not not anything to do with like you're not supposed to go outside or whatever it's the you can't yeah and I, I think that probably hurt a lot of people like me more than the actual alone time yeah so you were in Georgia the whole or you that's where you live so uh -huh. you guys were one of the earlier opening states thank god yes did you guys shut down your like did you here we have a lot of public pools and I did a walk this morning. As far as I could tell the public pool a mile away from me, isn't opening anytime soon. Um, Still. 
I didn't I didn't check to see if they had started to clean it, but the last time I walked by it, probably six weeks ago, it had two or three feet of leaves in it and it would need a serious power washing before they started to fill it. Wow. Um, did you guys have your public pools closed? Last year, they were closed. Did they yeah. even did they even open them up during the summer or was it only private places like- They, they were closed last summer. And it was an issue because uh, we have a swim team here, kids swim team here, City of Atlanta Dolphins that uses City of Atlanta pools, public pools. So they were having really push on trying to get just the swim team in and the protocols, the USA swimming had protocols. You can only have one kid at either end of, the, of a lane. Whereas in, before you would have 15 kids in one lane. So you had to space everything out. I mean, everybody's had to adjust, obviously, even with the pools and the kids, we had to adjust. Um, the private pools did some stuff. You know, they had coaches come in and, and again, it was spread everybody out. You do these six kids, they leave, you do the next six kids. So it was, it was a little difficult trying to do swim teams. Um, so yeah, I, I know people, I'm still having, we have warrior games in September. I still have people that haven't had an access to a pool in a year, but they're going to go to warrior games and try to compete in swimming. How does that work? That's crazy. Um, for you guys, as that's what, where I was going to go with that. So for for you as a coach, um, like I said, we left we left camp in January. I know the Navy had another one in February in Hawaii. I don't know if you went out to that one. I didn't go to that one. I went to SOCOM camp in March, end of March. So at what point in time did you personally, whether you were told or it was gut or instinct, know that it wasn't going to happen? Last year last year uh as soon as we shut down we shut down just knowing how the military works and the cya stuff i knew because even if a pool was open they had a travel ban on military so i was keeping up with that with one of my, one of my guys wives she and i talk about a bit she says we can't travel anywhere you know if you're if you're active duty that was next so it just kept and she was yeah it's, it's the ban till june i'm like well there's no way they're gonna lift that in time for people to travel or well, lift it in time to plan for people to travel even you know to, the war games takes a lot of planning oh yeah i, I can only Lots imagine what yeah. that is and yeah. how much of that planning are you guys involved in none okay so it's all on dod side and then tracy show well, up here uh, yeah it's dod it's also the the it's the mass military adapted sports program. So your safe Harbor, your battalions, it's, it's on them. They all plan that. Oh, okay. Yeah. Cause I know last year it was supposed to be here in San Antonio. Yes. I was so looking forward to that. And I was so looking forward to sitting in the stands rooting. I had no intention of doing it here. That being said, um, or wait, no, that was, yeah, that was 2020. Mm -hmm. That being said, there were, a whole nother set of people who got let down, which was the people who were supposed to go to the Hague for Invictus too. Yeah. Were you yeah. going to be involved with any of that? No, I was not invited to that last year. They picked, they picked new coaches that hadn't done it before. Oh, okay. So, so did, yeah. have you talked to any of your, any of your people that were supposed to go, how, how they're doing? I mean, yeah. I know, I know a lot of the Navy team kind of, got shuffled around. Um, I can't think of her name right off the top of my head. Just had a baby. So I don't know where she's going to go try to do the 2022 games. Right. Um, I just, one of my guys just texted me about it because, you know, it's supposed to be back on. I'm so, I'm actually really surprised they didn't do it this year. Although Europe is still locked down pretty much. So I guess that's why I get living in Georgia. I, I'm living everything normally right now. I, I, I don't even know if we're supposedly fully open, but everything I, we're open, you know? Yeah. So it's hard for me to realize that other people still aren't. When I've been living a fairly normal life for a year now, to hear that some places are still locked down is mind boggling to me, but everybody's got to do what's good for them. So I was really surprised I didn't have it this year, but 
I guess the same people that got picked last year are going to do it next year. If they're they <laughs> yeah, it, it, obviously if they're available and life hasn't changed. True. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So that'd be interesting. I, I would like to go. Even if I'm not coaching, I would like to go. Where is it? So is it still on in the Hague, or is it? So, as far as I know. Okay, because I'd heard I. So I had Peter Brown on the podcast, uh, the Aussie guy. I don't know oh, if yeah. you remember him. Yep. Um, you know, and he's gone full in on sport. Wow, I just sound like a Brit who can't talk English. He's gone full on in on being athletic. He's training. He's swimming. And he was telling me he's up in the oh God, the northeast or northwest of Australia. And okay. they, they didn't even realize there was a pandemic with how they were treating it. Wow. Meanwhile, a lot of their trainings in Melbourne and Melbourne shutting down for 10 cases. It, yep. It's so weird how different each area is taking care yep. of it. So he was really looking forward to going to the Hague and we'll see what happens with him this year or this year being the next, next. game. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I think, is he coming to games? Um, well, the next games, the next Invictus. I, I see. Oh. I don't even know if there's international teams invited this year to Orlando. Yes, there are. We talked about this and I'm trying to remember if it's from a country that's traveling, I believe they're coming. I think we have, it's a, it's a fewer number of international teams because of the traveling requirements. Um, but I, I think we still have four coming, maybe. Oh, okay, good. That's think, good. Yeah. yeah, it's always fun. The international athletes are always fun. And destructive to my liver. If you were hanging out with the Brits. Yes. Or the Dutch. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So what's your hope for um, for the future of the Warrior Games? from your perspective? Um, I would like to see it continued. And I realize we don't have as many combat related things going on right now, thankfully, you know, um, not to say, I don't want it to go away because who knows, we might have another serious issue over there that we need to take care of. Or, I mean, honestly, just even here, but you know, we have people that are still in the military. They're still going out there and, and put themselves in danger. So I don't, I definitely don't want to see it going away just because I believe it's needed even for people that aren't combat related injury. I just think it's needed for um, a lot of different reasons for a lot of different people. So hopefully it just continues. Uh, I don't think it's ever going to grow into something enormous, but I like what we do and we can keep it simple and still help and still get people um on a road to maybe they go to master swimming or maybe they start one of my guys now coaches archery because he did archery at warrior games, you know, things like that. It's, it's again, a lot of veterans, especially are looking for a purpose, a new thing to do. So this is another Avenue that we help with. It, it's a kind of an unintended consequence of competing. You take it and do something else with it. You either coach or you go into masters or, uh, you know, you help your kids with it, it, just anything like that. So again, it's just different positive aspects of this program or these programs. We need to keep it around. I'll just, just keep it steady. We don't have to make it this massive thing. We don't have to minimize it either. Just keep it steady. Just keep it going. Right. And I, I mean, I, I don't, now that it's going, I don't feel like there's a need to have a conflict attached to it. I can right. tell you, I can tell you, and I've told this story probably a hundred times in my life. As I got to Bamsey in 2007, yeah, 2007, after being medevaced out, there was myself, Bob Westover, um, McGinnis were the only three out of, I think, 27. Uh, people who were attached to the Navy, uh, not the Navy safe harbor, but the uh, the Navy liaison's office of active patients between Brook Army Medical Center and at the time they had uh, Wilford Hall, which is over at Lackland, about ten miles away. 
the three of us were the only combat wounded people. The vast majority uh, of people for the Navy were, there was a couple who were, what were they? They were motor vehicle accidents, mm-hmm. but the vast majority of them were cancer. This program well, would have would still be a benefit had the yes. three of us not existed. Yes, absolutely. I agree. Absolutely. So, I, yeah, I like you. I hope they continue it. Um, there's a couple small things I wish they had changed, like the two two times and done aspect of it because there are a lot of us who could probably use three or four or five times yeah we implemented that because there were certain people that kept coming back that needed to move over needed to move on um because this is this is intended to be a stepping stone for other things right Originally, it was kind of intended to be a stepping stone for Paralympic Games, but very, very few people are going to be able to go to that level. Paralympic Games are at an elite level. People don't understand that. They're like, oh, look at this poor person. They're trying to, no, no, no. That's an elite level, Paralympics. Um, if you don't think so, go check out the marathon results from Paralympics versus the Olympics. Really? Top three times with Paralympians. Okay. Paralympics beat the Olympics. So yeah, they're elite. So this, you know, as you see, this is a basic sports competition. I mean, how many of you guys did archery in high school? Or how many of you guys have raced cycling? Or how many of you ever swam on a swim team? Like this is a basic stepping stone. So that's what it was intended for. Some people were coming five, six, seven years. It's like, you need to make room for a new guy that needs it right. too. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you on that yeah. part. That's why we implemented that. Yeah. The, um, how impressed are you to see people who maybe not necessarily in swimming as much as, um, uh, some of the other sports, because I think a lot of people, at some point in time are exposed to the water, whether it's just to go splash around or whatever, but who you see get behind a bow or get um, on a bike yeah. and do a competitive road race. Yeah. At, at least very high level high school uh, competition, if not college level competition and have never done a road race before, or yeah. even in, in swimming cases, people getting silvers or maybe even gold to during that first two weeks of the trials had never really swam before. Yeah. What, what yeah. does that, what does that tell you about people in general? Um, well, for warriors in general, it's uh, the, the never quit thing seems cliche but it's so true it is so true it is i'm determined to try this i'm nervous about doing this but i'm gonna give it my best and then i'm gonna work hard at it and i'm gonna improve and i'm gonna do everything i can to do my best it's so for you guys because you're adults it does you get a little bit more of that self motivation um but also because you guys, you know, you were in your prime fitness going through whatever your boot camps and, and your training and all this stuff. And you had to be alert. So you guys know what it takes to be the best at what you're doing. And you bring that to your training and to your competition, which is, which is really fun to see. It, you guys, That's why it's so much easier to coach you guys sometimes. Because I just, I give you technique and I'll send workouts out and you have to do it on your own. You know, you're, you don't have a swim team in your hometown of uh, warriors. You go home and you might be the only one in your city and you're training by yourself. And that's hard to do. But you see the ones that do it. They do it all the time. They set up stands in their backyard for archery. Um, you know, they get a rower. They get an erg and practice their rowing at home on their own. That is so hard to do. And now you're trying to, now you're even talking about trying to train on your own for three and four different sports. Oh yeah, that's true. That's a lot of training and you guys do it. And I'm, that's what I'm impressed with is how you guys do it. You go home and you do it by yourself and you come back and you're better because you actually did it. (laughs) You actually did the training. 
Yeah, it, it's the the level of progression. Um, even that I see as an athlete with some of my teammates that happen from day one of the trials where we're out there, like you said, with the Marines, we're practicing, learning the basics yep. to the end of the trials to getting selected for the team, going to the camps and then showing up and competing at what I would personally consider a pretty damn high level. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can think of one athlete that got selected for team Navy, who this is probably going to do a lot for her. Yeah. Um, and she, Kelly, she's been on the podcast. I forgot about that. Uh, yeah, Kelly, she was a pretty high level triathlete prior to her injury. Yep. And I think that this is going to make a big difference for her this year in terms of getting her life, feeling like she's back to where she was. Yeah. Being athletic, being in shape, being strong. Yeah. You know, those are important. Yeah. And the good thing is it doesn't seem like um, a lot of people that I follow that I'm friends with fell off over the last year. Uh, they knew that this year would happen or they yeah. had hope that this year would happen. Yeah. So they, they allowed themselves to stay in shape and, and maintain it. So now for this question, for like you said, uh, one of your guys became an archery coach. If someone was to have interest in Co the, if they were a swimmer and they love being around water, how do you become a coach? Are there classifications and certifications? Yeah, it, depending what you coach. Um, for USA Swimming, yeah, there's some certifications that you have to do. Nowadays, you have to do a, what's called a safe sport. And it's just talking about, the, unfortunately, trying to keep children safe from adults in certain situations. So you have to do a safe sport class. Like you can't be in the locker room with the kids. An adult can't try to keep kids safe from certain things. Um, safe sport. And then there's some, I, but you have to de have CPR certification, uh, life saving certification, and then you can start coaching with those two, but then there's different levels. Um, as far as ASCA, which is American swimming coaches association, Level one, you can, there's a class and there's a book and a test. You can be level one and level two, but those also, as they get higher are dependent upon your level of coaching. So I'm a level two coach, even though I've been doing this forever, because I've never coached someone to go to senior nationals because I coach little kids. Oh, okay. So I, I, will, I will always be a level two coach, even though I've been doing this forever and blah, blah, blah. I just, I just don't coach those fast elite kids, which is fine with me. So there's different levels like that. Um, but if you wanted to coach a summer league team, basically it's like, hey, I trained with Warrior Games. I was taught by this coach and that coach, and I would like to help out. And a lot of people that get into coaching do that. They just kind of help out first. They help their kids out on their summer league team or they volunteer, things like that. So it just kind of depends on what, what you want to do with it. Okay, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I, I wanted to ask just because... Um, I'll be talking to Laura soon and I was going to ask her the same question about uh, the shooting coach. Mm -hmm. And I, I, cause I know that there's certain requirements. I just wasn't sure if there were any requirements for uh, swimming. I forgot to ask Kyle when I talked to him about track and mm -hmm. field. I'm so, sure. I'm sure it's similar track and field, probably similar. Yeah. I, I, I know we talked a lot about uh, USA track and field. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't sure if there were actual specific courses or, or things that you need to take, but it's good to know that. And um, do you have athletes that have expressed interest in coaching from the games? So we have two. So what year was that? 20. It was either 17. I think it was 17. Two of our SOCOM guys in archery were vying for gold and silver. They were the last two, two standing. And this was the most exciting archery thing I've ever seen in my life. They were shooting bullseyes, tens, 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 tens. So Rick shot a nine and the entire crowd was like, oh. So 
um, Josh kept shooting tens. Josh's very last shot, he shot a nine. So they tied. So I, I think they shot twice, uh, 10 times. They each had nine bullseyes and one nine. So they tied. It's sudden death. It's one arrow closest to the bullseye wins. So Josh shoots and he's, I mean, that much closer to the bullseye than Rick. And they got gold and silver. So Josh ended up coming back coaching for SOCOM. He did it for a year or so. Oh, he went to Invictus too. He went to Invictus and won and, and that, and that, that got him really interested in it. And so he came out and coached for SOCOM. Well, then he, um, with his kids and family, and I think he went back to school, couldn't make the next year, and Rick came in. So now he's coaching SOCOM. So you had those two guys that went nail, you know, neck and neck the whole time, and now they both co have coached SOCOM now. Right on. That's pretty yeah. cool. It's a neat story, yeah. Well, Tracy, do you... Uh... Do you have high hopes for your SOCOM swimmers or do you think Team Navy is going to take it all again this year? You know what? I have the largest team I've ever had. Oh, really? Yes. I actually have 20, 22 or 23 swimmers this year. I'm so excited. I can't Wait, stand how many? 22. Wow. Yes. I've, I've never had more than 12 show up at games. I'm, I, I'm, I can't stand how excited I am right now. Because, you know, last time in Tampa, um, was the first time I ever had a female relay. I never had four girls on the team. So my first ever female relay in Tampa in 2019 and our, um, open relay, uh, set the record by like, they shattered it like 10 seconds. That's the first record we ever had set. So I, if we can build upon that, yeah, it'd be amazing. So yeah, you didn't I'm, answer though. You, you didn't, you didn't answer the question. So is team Navy going to take it all? for swimming uh we shall see <laughs> we shall i don't know did you guys take it last time i have no idea i no. just like poking your buttons well you, so that's the funny thing is i rarely look at results yeah, i they, literally don't care don't care they, how fast but i want you to enjoy it i want you to do the best you can and you know we get some medals we get some that's fantastic but i was more psyched about having a female relay than anything else <laughs> like i said like i said us athletes are probably are exponentially more competitive than uh, the coaches yeah yeah i i agree i mean i've done it i've been super competitive and i'm just not anymore uh I've been there and done that i just i just enjoy watching you guys i enjoy helping and seeing seeing you guys realize I just did that. Like, Oh my God, I, I won a medal or I broke my best time or anything like that. You know, and, and stuff like captain James Howard, just getting up and down the pool. Sometimes that's what it's about. Yeah. That's that, that is the big takeaway is seeing people who you didn't think would be able to perform at an elite level, do what he did. Yeah. So on that note, I think we're going to close it out. Tracy, thank you so much for coming on. Um, oh, when, are, when are Warrior Games this year? You had to ask me the hard question, didn't you? September? Yeah, I, I know it's September. September. I think it's late September. 11th through... Oh, here it is. September. It looks like we're flying in the 8th and maybe leaving the 23rd. So probably... 22nd so the 17th or the 16th through the 22nd i'm thinking yeah swim meets last of course why is so, that not sure they just had it the schedule like that for a couple of years i appreciate it because i get to stay the whole time um oh that's right because they send you guys back once you're a couple years ago yeah unfortunately it sucks it really sucks yeah because i mean track and in the olympics track and field usually towards the end isn't it and swimming's usually in the in the middle if i remember it early early swimming's usually early is it uh-huh mm -hmm. so well we will find out the actual dates and put it in the show notes and hopefully there'll be a link coming out in the future to do the live stream uh which they typically do now yeah, just if you have, if you have need me to 
give that to you. Just, you know, keep reminding me and I'll send you the information as I get it. Yeah, I'll definitely hit you up on that. Yeah. And on that note, again, thank you, Tracy, for uh, oh, coming for on. Me. It was fun. And, and we will talk soon. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. Okay.